All right. Welcome back, everyone, to our final lecture, week 14, lecture two. So again, this will be our final lecture. We're going to do the second half of chapter nine. And remember, when I say second half, I don't mean necessarily in order of sections. We just kind of cover it all in one swift go. Reminder of due dates, 8.3 is due on the 25th, chapter nine homework. I said, just do it because you're going to see, you know, some stuff on it on the final exam. Nothing too crazy, nothing too heavy, but maybe a question or two. Nine point, oh, sorry, 9 sorry, 9 4 Excel mutual fund file due on the 27th, video quiz five due on the 27th, and the final exam will be the 27th only. So this Wednesday, the 27th, we will not have class, just in case you need that time to take the final exam. So again, this is our last meeting together on Wednesday. You take the final. If you can't take it Wednesday, you need to let me know so you can take it Tuesday or whatever we have to arrange, but we can't arrange it past Wednesday unless you've got paperwork uh, to uh, show exceptions to the rules and everything. So again, the final is one day only. No notes, with the exception of your two formula sheets, both available in Canvas, one from the midterm and then a new one, the finance formula sheet. You are allowed calculators, of course, no books. You'll use the midterm review that's available in Canvas to study the first four chapters, including chapter zero, so five technically. And a new review that's available in my math lab. And remember, I also put a another uh, review in Canvas for the chapter five through eight, five through nine stuff as well, if you prefer that style. But I know most people probably want the interactive one. So the final exam is cumulative. Uh, it will cover everything that we've done in this course. But if, but if it wasn't on one of these two reviews, it won't be on the final exam. So it's 20 questions, two hours. There is a place that will be available to submit your work in Canvas. The final and the work submission will only be visible on Wednesday the 27th, so you won't see those yet unless you're watching this later on the 27th. And the formula sheets are in Canvas. Uh, grades will take a little bit to calculate. This is definitely a, a super heavy uh, class to have to calculate, but remember, uh, I gave you that file kind of a third of the way through the semester so that you should be able to keep track of your own grades because my math lab doesn't say your grade canvas doesn't say your grade your grades are everywhere uh, and the way that my math lab calculates the grades that are even in there isn't even right to begin with so hopefully you have a decent idea of what your grade is but if you email me and ask me i'm just going to say put all your grades in that excel file i gave you and calculate yourself because that's the point of this class to teach you to fish not to give you a fish as the saying goes um I had some pretty major snafus with my technology. I was actually going to do a brand new lecture uh, for this one instead of playing a video because some of the stock numbers you're going to hear me talk about are definitely outdated. Uh, it, when I did this video, stocks were still cruising in an upwards directions. And right now they've been pretty flat and, you know, things were, were crashing a little bit, not crashing, but we had, we had some rocky times uh, back in January, February. So if, if you just see nothing but up, just remember this is old. And I just, my computers, I, I got a, a quote new computer like a month ago and it is giving me nothing but trouble. I can't even, it took me an hour to get on the internet this morning, but uh, I don't want to have that deter us from getting a lecture. So we're just going to use the old thing. It's not a huge deal anyways. Uh, the point of the lecture is still there. So let's uh, not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get it into it. Our last lecture together. It's an Excel section that we just do not need to cover. You've heard me mention this word a few times already. We talked about it and used a formula with it last time and used a website with it last time. But let's just take a little bit more time to discuss that. Annuities. This is an account where you add payments on a regular basis. Yes, a savings account could be considered an annuity. Yes, a checking account could arguably be considered an annuity. We usually don't call our retirement accounts annuities anymore though. It's kind of an old term that people tended to use for pensions, uh, where you just have a certain percentage payout at the end. You're always gaining a certain percent every year. For example, if you had a state job 10, 20 years ago, uh, your pension typically grew at 4% per year, and that never changed. And it's just the state would make their own investments. And if they made more than 4%, they just gave you 4%. If they made less than 4%, they still gave you your 4%, and they just hope to make up for it the next year. You know, <laughs> hashtag 2008 <laughs> stock market crash because of mortgage-backed securities. We don't need to get into that detail. So that's more what the word annuity usually is more relevant for, but we can still use it in a general sense of an account that you add payments to on a regular basis. 
Now those pension plans, those 4% per year, no matter what, which is pretty low, whispers into the mic. <clears throat> Um, because I've said we want to hit that 7% return if we can. That's the average over long, long times. So annuities, the traditional annuities, you have a fixed rate, whereas your investments where you're buying bonds and stocks and mutual funds and ETFs, those all vary on a daily basis. It's just they average out over a long, long time to hopefully a good number. So again, using the word annuity loosely, just in the sense of we're adding payments on a regular basis. So this is how we're supposed to save up for retirement. You pick 50 bucks a paycheck and you slide it into your uh, 401k or your IRA or your brokerage or your whatever, or a hundred bucks a month or uh, 200 bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month or three bucks a day, whatever it is that you are capable of doing on a certain time interval. Now we do prefer that you do something called pay yourself first, that you have this percentage or this dollar amount that you're going to hit no matter what, and you're not going to adjust it no matter what. So even if you have three bucks to spare at the end of the month, you still put that hundred dollars in your retirement fund first before you start paying your other bills before you start going and having fun. That's the idea. <clears throat> it's called paying yourself first. <clears throat> so hold on. still kind of messed up from a few weeks ago. All right. So what are these retirement accounts called? Because they, there's a few different names. They, they operate differently. Let's get into that. So we've got our 401k. That's the first thing. And this is usually the first thing that people get into with retirements. A 401k is an employee or employer sponsored. And sometimes they're known as a 403b. Sometimes you'll have a 401k and a 403b. Don't worry about the different numbers. It's just about one of them might be what the employer is putting in and one of them is what the employee is putting in. And I uh, actually get them backwards. I think the 403b is what the employer does, but don't hold me to that. It doesn't technically matter. So your 401k is where your employer says, all right, we're gonna give you the opportunity to take some money and put it into an investment where we won't tax you on the money you put in. So normally if you make $1,000, if you're making like 50 grand a year, Uncle Sam is gonna take about 25% of that, roughly between state taxes, federal taxes, FICA, um, all that different stuff. Well, if you put it into a 401k, a traditional 401k, you don't pay that 25% roughly tax, and that means that that $1,000 that would have before turned into $750 in your pocket, that $1,000 goes into the investment as $1,000. Now, as your 401k grows, you'll pay taxes on the interest when you start pulling it out. So the money you put in is tax-free, but the interest, the free money you get, you'll pay taxes on that later. You won't pay taxes on the money you put in. That's still tax-free. So if you put, say, $10,000 in, and at the end of your retirement, when you start getting ready to withdraw, you have 30000 that means that you would have twenty grand. you would have to pay taxes on as you withdraw it. Now, if you withdraw it all at once, then you have to pay the taxes all at once. If you withdraw it over time, you pay the taxes over time. So with a 401k, what most employers offer is a cash match. And a lot of them will say, all right, for every dollar you put in, we'll put a dollar in. Then there's others that will say, for every dollar you put in, we'll put 50 cents in. So it doesn't have to be dollar for dollar. It can be you put in a dollar, they put in 50 cents. And it, it could be anything they decide. You could put in a dollar and they put in 67 cents if they wanted to be weird. It's usually one to one or one to two though as a ratio. Now, they won't do this for an unlimited amount of dollars. There are maximum contributions per year to a 401k, which currently is $19,500. And that's a lot to be throwing away, not throwing away, throwing into your retirement, definitely not throwing away. That was a poor choice of word. But your employer is probably not going to match almost twenty thousand dollars of your of your investment. They'll say, "All right, we'll match you dollar for dollar up to five thousand dollars, or we'll match you dollar to dollar versus fifty cents up to two grand, or we'll match you dollar to dollar up to ten grand." It, there'll be some nominal amount that they'll match, and you want to take every penny of that you can because that's just more money you're getting. So. You originally make, let's say, $30,000 a year, 
and your employer offers to match dollar for dollar up to $10,000, which means if you put $10,000 in your 401k, your salary just went from 30 grand to 40 grand because they're going to give you another 10 grand. And 10 grand of that that you put in is tax free and the 10 grand they put in is tax free. So you now make $40,000 where only 20 grand of that's being taxed. Now that's an extreme situation. I find most employers max, max out around $5,000, but I can't say I've looked at every scenario in the universe. Uh, there are employers that are much more generous with their match. There are employers that are much less generous with their match. Maybe I know a situation where someone's 401k only matches up to $20 per paycheck and, it's a, and they're only putting in 50 cents for every dollar. <laughs> Maybe someone's thumbs are pointing in their direction. Um, all right, so 401k, <clears throat> this is employer-based, so you have to have a job to get a 401k. And I think that's about enough to say about that. 401k, I think you can start withdrawing at uh, 59 and a half, or maybe it's 62, or maybe it's 55. I don't have that number up here, but it's in your 50, mid to late 50s, at worst, early 60s. I wanna say it's 55. A quick Google could fix that. You're going to be patient with me for about 15 seconds. Fifty-nine and a half. That's what I thought. I thought it was the same as IRA. All right, so 401k, you can start withdrawing without penalty at 59 and a half. Yes, you can withdraw before then, but there's all sorts of penalties that we're not getting into the details of in the interest of time. All right, so what's next up on the retirement list? You have IRAs and Roth IRAs. So an IRA kind of stands for individual retirement account or independent retirement account, something like that. So this is money outside of your job. This is money as long as you have a job, you can invest into a retirement account, but your employer is not gonna match any money in this. It's just, if you wanna put in $5, you're putting in $5. So what's the difference of IRA versus Roth IRA? And the first one where I just have IRA, a lot of people will call that the traditional IRA. But without the word traditional, it means the same thing. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit to where we have, here we go, we're down here. Remember how I said with that 401k, you're putting in non-taxed money, but the interest is taxed? That's the same as with your traditional IRA, the first one. You're going to put money in. I'm sorry, I, I said first, <laughs> but I have them backwards. I did not realize that. So let me just highlight that one. With a traditional IRA, you're putting money in that is tax-free. So if you earn $1,000, you put $1,000 in. That $1,000 doesn't turn into $750 because Uncle, Tam, Uncle Sam takes a slice. It's just $1,000. Now you might say, well, Mr. Beckner, my, my paycheck already took those taxes out. So how is it that I haven't paid taxes on it if my paycheck took it out? Well, you see, Bob or Jane, at the end of the year, when you file your taxes, you'll get that money back. That's how it works. Yeah, it'll come out of your paycheck at first for these IRAs, but then at the end of the year, you're going to file your taxes and you're going to say you put money into a traditional IRA and they're going to go, oh, okay, well, we owe you some money then. Here's those tax dollars back. So a traditional IRA is, most similar, is more similar to a traditional 401k in that you put money in that's tax-free, but then any interest you get would be taxed. So the free money you get for investing is taxed. And that's not the end of the world. A lot of people make a ton of money with traditional IRAs. Some people that make buttloads of money every year, like 200 grand a year, have to take a traditional IRA. They don't have the option of a Roth. If you're young especially, and you're not making $200,000 a year, Roth, in my opinion, in my highly educated opinion, Roth is the way to go because you're going to put money in that is taxed now. You're going to go ahead and pay that taxes on the dollars you put in, but then the interest grows tax-free. And we have seen all these scenarios where we can put like 60 grand in and have it turn into a million dollars over 50 years. Or uh, maybe we put like 200 grand in and have it turn into a million dollars over 30 years or 35 years. We've seen these scenarios. And we've seen that the amount of interest we get <clears throat> when we have good growth, when we have good time, the interest is massively more than what we put in. So me personally, my mindset is I'd rather pay the taxes on the smaller amount and then get tax-free the larger amount. 
Now, there are different schools of thought. Some people will say, well, Mr. Beckner, <clears throat> with that traditional IRA, uh, couldn't you, when you get your tax money back, couldn't you invest those dollars as well to kind of counteract it? And yes, you could. There's some crazy math and some crazy predictions you have to make to try and say which one is officially better or worse. But most people don't end up reinvesting those tax dollars back um, just because of our typical American mindsets. So that's why I think the Roth is the better way to go, but I'm not telling you what to do. This is not advice, <laughs> this is education. <clears throat> no lawsuits. So a Roth IRA, once again, is where you put money in that you're already gonna pay the taxes on. So if you put $1,000 in, you're not getting a refund on that $250 come tax day. But the interest you, gr you grow over time is all going to be free tax to you. So if you're a really good investor and you put $1,000 in and it turns into $30,000, that's $29,000 you're not paying the taxes on. I'd rather not pay the taxes on twenty nine dollars and pay the taxes on one grand. And uh, I was actually talking to someone about 20 years old the other day, maybe related to me, and uh, they were like, that sounds like, a, that sounds like a scam. Like, are we scamming the government? No, we're not. That's, these systems are set up to give us lower income people advantages. That's why there's an income cap on these Roth IRAs. If you make too much money, you don't get this advantage. Now, it's pretty difficult to make that much money. The average American is not making $200,000 a year, but you could certainly work towards it. And then I hope at that point you're going, yeah, I don't really need that break anymore. I'm okay. I got $200,000 a year coming in. Now, I said your 401k, the most you can put in currently is $19,500 per year. With an IRA, whether it's Roth or traditional, your max is six grand per year. Now, these amounts will change over time. In fact, the IRA amount just changed to six grand uh, I want to say in 2018, it was 5,500. Maybe it was 2017, but it was just a few years ago. I'm going to say 2018, it was 5,500. So maybe in a few years, it goes to 6,500. I don't know. I can't confirm, deny, or predict that. So your 401k, your Roth and traditional IRAs, these are the best things you can invest into first. And I would say, depending on your mindset, the 401k is the thing you hit at first because you get those cash match uh, contributions from your employer. Then next up, I'd start hitting the IRAs. Some people would say differently. Maybe even in my personal investing, maybe I would disagree with the statement I said. And the reason is 401ks have a much more limited selection of what you can invest to. They'll usually have something like a, a year plan, like you're going to retire in 2055, so you invest in the 2055 plan. And it's very, very diverse, which is awesome, but it's also maybe a little too safe in your early 20s and maybe even early 30s. Again, maybe too safe. I'm not saying safe is bad, but maybe you notice that you've got a 401k and an IRA, and your 401k is getting you like 9% per year. And your IRAs, because you're maybe a little more aggressive while you're younger, while it's not so bad to lose a bunch of money um, because you can make up for it later, Maybe you're getting 15 or 20% per year because you're lucky or you've researched this stuff or maybe it's just a good year. I don't know, but there's much more selection with these IRAs. 401ks, again, they have these 2035, 2040, 2045 plans, which are very broad. And then you can invest into small cap, large cap uh, funds, which are basically just different stock plans like your S&P 500 um, or your small cap version of the S&P 500, smaller companies. Whereas your IRAs, there are literally tens of thousands of different choices. I can speak as a state employee, I have about 12 to 15 choices for my 401k. And they, they grow, that's good. But again, with if I just go to any independent finance company like Fidelity or Acorns or... Um, uh, <laughs> wow, all my, all my terms just left me. Webull or uh, eToro or Robinhood literally tens of thousands of funds available that I can choose from. And I can do a lot more research and find things that might have, they, they claim to have had 30% growth over the past five years or 10 years. And you go, well, that sounds good. Maybe that's where I want to invest. It's up to you. All right. So what's the difference of these types of investments? Actually, no, one more thing, brokerage accounts before we get into that. Brokerage accounts is something else you can invest into. And I would say this is the last tier at a 401k IRA than brokerage because there are no tax benefits with brokerage accounts. You're, the money you put in will be taxed, 
the interest you get will be taxed. So you go, well, why would you ever invest in a brokerage? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, with a brokerage, there's no age that you have to meet a minimum to withdraw your money. You can withdraw it tomorrow and have no penalties. You can withdraw it in five years and have no penalties. So maybe you want to, you've saved up money for 10 years and then you want to buy a big fancy house and put 20% down. Then you go, well, I got 50 grand in my brokerage. Let's use that as a down payment. Maybe that's your decision. And you can do that with no fees. If you try and take money from your 401k, you're going to hit with fees. Uh, generally speaking, there are exceptions with FHA, uh, FHA loans and things like that. We're not getting into the, all the, the science and, and details of this stuff. Um, we're, we're doing broad topics. Uh, your Roth IRAs, you can actually withdraw the money you've put in, but not the interest. Your traditional IRAs, that's not the case. That's another advantage of Roth IRAs, by the way. If you put six grand in and there's 10 grand sitting in it, you can take that six grand out without penalty, but you have to leave the four grand of interest in. So these brokerage accounts, once again, you don't have to wait till retirement age to pull the money out. You don't have to wait till 59 and a half or whatever it might be 10, 20, 30 years from now because these things tend to change over time as our average life extends. So that's one benefit. The second benefit is, all right, you're just a super saver or make, maybe you make a boatload of money each year. So you maxed out your 401k, you put 19,500 in that year. And then you maxed out your IRA, you put six grand in that. That's $25,500 that you've already invested. You go, well, I still got 10 grand burning a hole in my pocket. And I'm, I'm a very, very frugal person. So you go, well, let me throw it in a brokerage instead of throwing it in some crummy savings account earning 0.2% or, or, or a checking account earning nothing or, uh, or bonds maybe earning two to 3%, which we'll get into in a minute. So again, yeah, you'll pay taxes on the money you invest. So basically the money from your paycheck, you already pay those taxes. And then whenever you start withdrawing it at the end of the year, you'll have to pay taxes on whatever you withdrew. But if you're getting 20, 30% returns, is it really awful to be paying the taxes on that? No, that's insane growth. Now, again, I'm not guaranteeing you can hit that. Maybe you're just gonna hit that 7%, but even still paying taxes on 7% just means you're really getting like five and a half percent. Ooh, that's still free money. And that could be a ton of money. So there are benefits to the brokerage account. Um, here's that thing I said about your Roth IRA that you can pull money out without a penalty uh, if it was what you put in, but you can't pull out growth, you can't pull out interest. Now you might say, well, Mr. Beckner, how do I tell them that I'm pulling out the money from what I put in and not the interest? It's automatic. It's automatic. That's the cool thing. Uh, one last type of bigger savings uh, plan is your college savings plan, the 529, which is tax deferred as well. The money you put in is tax-free, so you get that money back at the end of the year, um, the tax portion, that is to say, <laughs> not the whole thing, just the tax portion. Um, and that's if you have kids that you want to send off to college in 10, 15, 20 years. You also have, some people will call their, uh, oh, I can't think of the name, the HSA, your health savings accounts, an investment. And, and you can argue that I don't really want to get into that details because HSAs work very, very differently from employer to employer from a health insurance company to health insurance company, whether it actually rolls over from year to year or not. So I want to avoid that topic. All right. So I keep talking about these mutual funds. Mutual funds are bundles of stocks. Also, there are ETFs. ETFs are bundles of stocks as well. They are literally the same thing except for one main key feature. There, there are other differences, but the key feature is when you actually trade them, whether the trade goes in at the end of the day or the second you do it. Mutual fund trades go in at the end of the day. ETFs go in instantly. Most days, there's really not a big deal between them. It's only on like critical days where the market's crashing 10% or we see some crazy 8% growth that day where that might make a difference but they're both awesome. Mutual funds and ETFs, both awesome. Uh, buy as much of them as you can over your life to make lots of money, in theory. Bonds are your safer investments, which have much lower average returns. Bonds are money that you're lending someone else. Well, you go, well, isn't everything else pretty much the same? Yes, but in most cases, bonds are where you're lending the government money. So government-issued bonds, and you might a lot of people think, all right, well, I got to go to the bank and buy this piece of paper. No, you can actually buy these through your retirement accounts as well. There are mutual funds that have bonds in them. There are mutual funds that you can buy that are you owning property, essentially. You're buying a bunch of people's mortgages. So you're arguably <laughs> owning a very, very small slice of, some, of a whole bunch of people's properties and things like that. 
Um, and again, if all these little details are am I, I'm just going too fast, I highly encourage you to go to YouTube or just the internet in general and, and just Google things like, you know, what's a bond? How do I invest in bonds? Uh, what are in bonds? What do they grow like? And there are plenty of people out there that will take much more time explaining things um, and, and educating you. I just have so much time on my hands. So a lot of people will say, all right, you should be buying bonds and you should be buying mutual funds and maybe you should be buying some individual stocks as well. That's your retirement plan. Some people will say you need a 30% bond, 30% mutual fund, 30% uh, cash plan. Some people will say you need 50% bonds. Some people will say you need 10% bonds. Again, this depends on how aggressive or how not aggressive you wanna be. Bonds are for your not being aggressive phases. So when you're older, when you're retirement age, when you don't want a market crash to affect you nearly as much, maybe that person would want 50, 60, 70% of their investments in bonds. When you're younger and a market crash isn't going to affect you because you're not even gonna be withdrawing any money for 20, 30, or 40 years, if you've got $10,000 in and you lose half, now you're 5,000, that's really not a big deal considering that you're still gonna be a millionaire later if you follow the suggestions I've made over this course. And as long as you know, America doesn't go downhill. but you're not gonna become a millionaire on bonds in general, not as, not as easily at least. So again, I'm not telling you to not buy bonds at all, um, I, but it is generally, <clears throat> generally accepted that you should be buying more bonds as you age because you wanna be safer as, all right, I've got a million dollars now. If the market crashes tomorrow, that means I lose $500,000 you know, over a week or over a month or something like that, maybe. I'm not, I'm not, not all crashes work that quickly. Some of them take a long time to, to drain you away. <laughs> but again, the point is, it's not awful to suffer a crash in your 20s or 30s or even 40s, especially because we have recovered from every single crash we've ever gone through and usually right after a crash, things accelerate and grow back. So you might lose that $5,000 and then in two years, you get every penny of it back. And while you were investing, while the market was essentially on sale, you will grow even more. So there's benefits to buying during a crash as well. And again, this, are not, this is not advice. <laughs> this is just telling you things that can happen. Go and do your own research and make your own decisions. All right, so I've said these places out loud a few times. Um, one I haven't mentioned before is Vanguard. There are numerous places you can go to get your mutual funds and other retirement accounts with. Uh, Vanguard and Fidelity, the two biggest ones in my opinion. Then you've got uh, Robinhood who really changed the game. It used to be most retirement accounts, you'd have to pay $5 for a trade and fees and percentages were larger and such. Then Robinhood came in several years ago and said, no, nah, we're not gonna charge any fees. Now nah, we're gonna lower our percentages and then everyone else pretty much had to do the same thing. And then you have uh, companies like Acorns where they'll do this roundup feature where if you go to the store and you put $4.60 on your card, you can use Acorns to just call it $5 and now you've put 40 cents into investments without even thinking about it. And then you've got Webull who is, uh, really cool in, in my opinion that they offer a few free stocks at least at this moment that's not going to last forever uh, robin hood has done the same and then you've got eToro, which claims to let you copy other people's investment portfolios uh, i have not looked into this personally i'm just describing a commercial that i've seen very recently but i want to research it i think i've said that more than once and there's there's dozens of other companies besides the ones i'm listing so see what which interface you like you can do this online most of them if not all of them have apps um, this is pretty easy if you don't have any clue once you start your account how to actually transfer money from your savings or checking to your Fidelity account and then actually buy the stocks. Guess what? There's a Google or a YouTube for it. This stuff can be much easier than most people think. Most people get very intimidated by this between the potential for loss of money all of a sudden, which again, if you're young, shouldn't matter because you're not going to pull money from this in general for another 30 or 40 years, as well as the, oh my Lord, what do I buy? Well, I've already said one of the things you can do is just invest. You could choose to invest in simple index funds like the S&P 500. And all of these companies have something that mirrors the S&P 500. 
or you can uh, buy something that mirrors the NASDAQ if you really like tech, or you can buy something that mirrors the Dow Jones, which is much more the industrial side of things. Uh, or maybe you wanna buy things that are, are all based on medical technology, or maybe things that are just retail. There are bundles of these uh, out there, and you can follow this link to see a bunch. How much time do I have? Here we go. So I, I like Fidelity. I won't lie. I use Fidelity. So that's what I have a little more reference with. So this page right here just takes you to a whole boatload of things you can invest in. This is not even all of them. This is just some samples and this is domestic equity, which is things like your blue chip fund. And if you click one of these, it'll actually show you how it's done over a 10 year span. So anything you put in 10 years has, 10 years ago has grown by this much per year. Uh, that's a large number. <laughs> uh, we, this is kind of a crazy year because of what happened in March and how tech kind of just shot past it. So don't expect this usually, but holy cow, that's a big number. You can see expense ratios. So that's a portion that they'll take out every year. Now, admittedly, almost a percent is a little more large, but larger than average. But I mean, you're paying 0.75% to get 20% growth a, a year. I, I'm okay with that as long as that continues. I'm not promising it continues they will show you where their, if you hit composition, uh, their top few holdings. So they've got Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Nvidia, Tesla, uh, Salesforce, Marvell, which is a technology group, and then Visa. This is not all of their holdings, it just makes up half. So there's 418 companies, so this is just the top 10. So they're saying about half of your investments are in these companies. And oh boy, these companies grew a lot over the past year. If you don't know about Tesla, you need to find out. Um, and again, past performance does not dictate future performance. I'm not telling you to invest in Tesla, but I'm saying if you had invested in Tesla a year ago, you made some money. <laughs> Same with all these companies up here. All right, so pretty aggressive tech funds. Uh, maybe you don't like tech. Maybe you just wanna do that S&P 500 thing I kept talking about. Where is it? I am not seeing it. I know the, the code. It's F-X-A-I-X. Um, there's just too many letters up here. This page, that's why. Uh, da, 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 index, that's why. Domestic stock. Where are we? Am I blind? All right, so I'm just gonna hit search, <laughs> F-X-A-I-X, because I know what that one is. I'm just trying to rush and I, it's not working for me. So here's that thing that mirrors what I call the S&P 500, which again, traditionally returns 7% over a long span of time. Right now, we've had really insane growth over the past 10 years, so it's about twice what it normally is. So a lot of people will say, hey, expect this not to, not to happen much longer. And again, past does not dictate future, who knows? Maybe things are gonna change, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, you could just buy a little bit of every single piece of stock out there that's not a penny stock. So back on this page, uh, under index, I swear that should have been on this one, uh, F-S-K-A-X. Oh, there it is, I, I am blind, there it was. <laughs> This is the total stock market. So this is buying a little piece of every stock on average worth more than a dollar. And look, even that's grown pretty well. I mean, I'm just trying to show you that these numbers aren't made up. I didn't pull these out of thin air. We've had pretty good growth over the past 10 years. Every When you buy a little bit of everything. Now, if you buy 10 stocks, I can't promise you those are all gonna go up. Maybe they will go down. If you bought uh, something like Nikola, yeah, you had a bad time. Why is that happening? I didn't click anything. So that's why we suggest that people buy mutual funds, um, or at least consider the option of buying mutual funds, I'm not telling you what to do. Because when you buy bundles of stocks, some will go up, some will go down, but on average, you have more going up than down. 
and the stronger companies go up significantly to make up for the weaker companies going down and you still make money. Now, maybe you just invest in Apple and Tesla and you make $10 billion in three years because those are some of the best growing stocks. But again, who knows what happens two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Maybe you do a little bit of both as you learn. Maybe that's a good idea. So again, you've got different sectors where you can just buy just healthcare stuff. And there's a few options there. You can buy just real estate stuff. You can buy energy stuff. And so let's look at energy. I feel like most of the energy ones are, are red and it's not awful, but I don't know. I don't want to lose 3% a year over 10 years. You know, maybe these will pick back up. A lot of people think energy is struggling right now because we're getting ready to shift the, the winds to from oil to much better, much better resources, electric cars and things like that. So maybe that's why oil is struggling. And again, I'm not telling you things, I'm suggesting reasons for things that are happening. Financial portfolios, information tech. Um, I, I mean, tech has done pretty well over the past 10 years. <laughs> that's not bad at all, 21%. Uh, here's another tech one. 20%, but the one year growth has been better in this one than the other one. 37 versus, sorry, I'm looking at the year to date. 40% versus, come on, computer, you're killing me. The, well, it's on there. This chart shows the theoretical growth. If you put $10,000 in 10 years ago, what it would turn into, and that was like $70,000. This one's about $60,000. Yeah, so this just one tech portfolio versus another. One of them had a one year growth of almost 60%, the other, it was 40%. Are you supposed to get upset if you invest in the one that's 40% and that your buddy invests in the 60%? No, you should be happy that you got 40% growth. That's the mindset to take positivity. Oh man, I didn't buy Bitcoin when it was $100. Crud. No. That tells you, hey, take, take take this money and invest in something later. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It doesn't have to be something super, super aggressive. Just invest in something. But broaden your horizons, invest in lots of different little things. That's what most people would say the concept is to do. Uh, thematic investing. These are all new. I will be honest. I've never seen these before. They are so new. So because they're new, you're not going to see 10 year, five year numbers. It's just going to see, you know, what it's done recently, which they're saying this has been around for like a month. Huh, interesting. I got more research to do. So those were all Fidelity funds. If you buy, if you have a Fidelity account and, and buy Fidelity funds, they don't charge you fees. If you get a Vanguard account and buy Fidelity funds, they're probably going to charge you a fee in those instances. Vanguard would have their own sets of funds. They won't be exactly like those Fidelity ones. They'll have the index funds that mirror the S&P and the NASDAQ and the Dow and the total market, but they won't necessarily have that same technology fund. They won't necessarily have that same energy fund that I showed. So we gain, most people are gaining money on that interest. And that's what we saw with that growth, that $10,000 turning into $70,000 because every year on average, it was growing 21%. Not saying every year it grew 21%. First year it might have grew 10. The second year it might have grown 30. The, the next year it might lose 30%. Then the next year it might gain 80%. It's just saying it averages out to that 20% number. But that's not the only way that we gain money in stocks. We can also gain money by something known as dividends, which we did some math with dividends one time a long time ago. Um, but this is just money that you get for free because the company is profitable. So many companies will say, hey, we made some profit. We're going to pay back some of this profit to our investors. So you have your interest from other people buying the stock, from it being uh, well sought out after. And then you have dividends where some companies go, hey, we made a million dollars this year. Let's give a dollar to each person holding a share. And they give you money based on shares some companies might give you three cents per share. Some people might give you $5 per share. It depends on how profitable and how generous they are. Not all companies offer dividends on their stocks or mutual funds. 
Amazon does not offer <laughs> dividends. Amazon doesn't do a lot of things that Amazon should be doing, in my opinion, like paying their employees better or giving them better working conditions or yada, 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 but let's not get into that. Uh, and there are plenty of companies just like Amazon in that regard. I'm just naming one because it's one of the biggest companies out now. So some people will say, I really like dividend investing because then I can just take those dividends and pocket it and, and live off of that maybe. Or you could take your dividends and reinvest. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of companies in the energy sector will pay really solid dividends, but the counterbalance is that they're in the red each year with their interest. They're, you're losing a little bit each year. So you might get 7% dividends, but then you're losing 3% per year. So basically that means you've gained 4%. That's not awful, but maybe you could have gained better money somewhere else. And again, I'm not telling you to not dividend invest. I'm telling you to research it, consider it, and make your own decisions. So one of the most important things for you to do is to figure out this retirement game, do some research. Hopefully I've helped a little bit here, but I can only say so much without actually starting to give advice and I'm not allowed to give advice. I'm allowed to just give perspectives. Um, <clears throat> so we, we started out with that simple idea of, all right, take your Starbucks cup of coffee, $3.50 a day for 50 years and you become a millionaire by investing in things like this. Maybe quicker if the market's better. Uh, maybe quicker if you make better selections. I don't know. But then I also said, well, one, another thing that you can do is you can bump up your investment over time. When you're 18, $3.50 a day is a lot of money. When you're 40, if you've been financially savvy over time, $3.50 a day shouldn't be a lot of money anymore. Maybe you can start putting in five bucks a day or seven bucks a day and hit that million sooner or turn your goal into $2 million maybe or something like that. But one thing that is ultimately important, and this is one of the number one issues of the American besides not having their three to six month emergency fund sitting in savings for, like I said, emergencies. Um, what is it, 90 or 95% of Americans can't afford a thousand dollar emergency that happens just right now. Uh, the other issue is credit cards. People have credit card debt on average, eight to $10,000 worth of debt per person. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, please pay off your credit cards now. I'm crying for you if you don't pay off your credit cards. <laughs> um, and the third is mo money, mo problems. More officially known, <laughs> not by the, the wise man once said, but as lifestyle creep. All right, so you're 18, you're, you're living off a $10 an hour job or less and you're, you know, you're, you're living with your parents and you just can't buy a lot of things. And then you get out of college and you get your $40,000 a year job and you get your apartment and your slightly used car and your whatever else and you start paying off your student loans and you go, well, I'm making $40,000 a year now. Instead of going out on Saturday and spending 10 bucks, I'm gonna go on Saturday and spend 100 bucks. Or instead of buying that $10 pair of jeans at Old Navy, I'm gonna buy the $100 pair of jeans that I don't know, name a store where you get a hundred dollar pair of jeans. <laughs> Clearly, you know where I'm shopping. And ten dollars is exaggerated, maybe 20, 25. That's 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 more average, you know, but you get the point. What is it? HM, you can go and get six dollar shirts instead of going somewhere else and getting fifty dollar shirts. You know? So again, most people they start making more money, and that means they start spending more money. But unfortunately, we don't build our our um our, uh, our monthly budgets or our yearly budget or whatever it is you want to do. So we go, oh, well, I'm making $40,000 a year. That's an insane amount of money in comparison to what I used to make. So I'm going to start spending more. And then the credit card bill rolls in and you go, oh, um, whoops, I'm, I shouldn't be spending that much money, I guess. But then you keep spending it because you've already adjusted to it. You've gone from hamburger to steak and you can't go back to hamburger. That's actually a, a poor comparison because, I mean, who can't go back to a hamburger? Let's say you've gone from bologna to steak. You're not going back to bologna after that, at least not Oscar Mayer. <laughs> Raises his hand, grew up on bologna. Not ever going to buy Oscar Mayer bologna again in my life. <laughs> so lifestyle creep. Avoid it as best as you can. Just because you make that $40,000 a year job, just creep up a little. Don't start spending $100 out on your Saturday. Maybe spend 15 or 20 bucks out on your Saturday. Learn to meal prep at home. Things like that will help you avoid that lifestyle creep. And then you've got more money to invest. 
and then that money can make you money, it can work for you, it can make you a million dollars. Maybe instead of retiring at 67, you retire at 57. The money you make now has more potential than the money you're gonna make 30 years from now because the money you make now, you can throw in these investments and make it work for you. And that $10 you put in now can turn into $100 later. Let's go to our annuity calculator. Spell annuity correctly first. Da -da -da -da. Let's say we invested $1, just $1 at our average 7% return accounted for inflation, which would be 9% if we assume 2% inflation. And this is a dollar that we put in when we're 18 and we plan on retiring at 67, so 49 years. Look at what this $1 will turn into. $68. And that's with, the, again, this historical average that maybe you can beat, maybe not. I'm not telling you what you can or cannot do. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm giving you options to look at past performances and, and, and make decisions based off of that. But the $1 you put in today is worth $68 in the future. Now, you might say, well, that's in future dollars. Well, let's, let's turn this 9% into 7 so that would, count, that would account for inflation, and now we're thinking in terms of our dollars now. So that $1 you invest today is now almost $30 later. So what would you rather have, your dollar today or $27 in the future? And you're not just going to invest a dollar today, you're going to keep adding to the pile. So you've got a dollar that you start with. You start with $20 now, and then every month you're going to add uh, $100 in, whatever, something like that. Oh, there's $472,000. Oh, well, you know, Mr. Beckner, eventually I can add more. Well, you'd have to you know, do this for 20 years and then for 29 years. And you can adjust for this or you can do it in Excel. You go, well, Mr. Beckner, I'm capable of putting $200 a month in right now. So adjusted for inflation and all that, now you've got almost your million dollars later. Oh, Mr. Beckner, I can't handle that. All I can do is 50 bucks for now. All right, so this account where you're doing 50 is gonna earn you $236,000 by, by the time you're ready to retire. And then hopefully you've got another account that you've been adding to that, or you've been adding to this pile and it, this just isn't accounting for it. Put very little increments of money over a long period of time invested in the right place. I'm telling you, will make you money. All right, <clears throat> pay off your credit cards, invest wisely. Oh, uh, here was just a, a quick YouTube search I did, how to invest in Fidelity, and the second one, how to buy stock in Fidelity takes you step by step through it. It doesn't have to be stock, it's also mutual funds, bonds, ETFs, whatever. Which, by the way, I don't think I said this, but I want to see where it is in writing. Da, 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 here it is. Your IRAs, your Roth IRAs, your brokerage accounts, all of them can access the exact same mutual fund. So if I have a Fidelity account and I wanted to buy that FXAIX, which was that S&P 500 mirror, a little piece of the top 500 companies in our country right now. If I wanted to buy that, I can buy it as an IRA or I can buy it as a Roth IRA or I can buy it as a brokerage. There are just little drop-down menus in, in Fidelity to do that, or in Vanguard, or in whatever place you choose to hold your accounts. And you can hold accounts in separate places. Now, if you have a Fidelity and a Vanguard account, you go, well, all right, if I can put $6,000 into an IRA, that means I can now put 12,000 because I have two accounts. Wrong. <laughs> it's 6,000 across all of them. So if you put 6,000 in a Vanguard IRA and then 6,000 in a Fidelity IRA, the tax man's gonna come after you at the end of the year. So don't do that, 6,000 total. All right, let us remind ourselves about these formulas. Whenever it wants to pull up, there we go. Good Lord, this computer is just moving at a snail's pace today. The four that we've used the most were these three and then this one. These three are for one-time investments. P <clears throat> means a one-time borrow or lending situation, whether you're borrowing the money or you're the one putting into the savings account, whatever. It's a one-time investment. So you use these three formulas when it's a one-time investment. Well, how do you go from there? 
how do I know whether you use first, second, or third? Well, use the first one when it's compounding annually, which means the n is one, so we don't need to see the n. We use this one when we're compounding n times, but also these are for when we know the starting value because we have the p. <clears throat> this third one is when we know the ending value. And if you say, oh, well, what about if it's compounding annually, then just remove the n or make the n one. This fourth formula was for converting APR, which is what we call R, to APY, the rate as it's compounding monthly, what it would be equivalent to if you only compounded once per year. That's what that does. The next three formulas, <clears throat> you see that word annuity, which the word annuity means, that's not far enough down. Let me pull this back. The word annuity means, oh geez, it scrolled out while I was drawing. This means that we're making multiple deposits. Payment, payment, payment. Payment means something you're doing over and over and over. That's the easy way to tell whether you're using an annuity formula or the top three formulas, whether I tell you it's a one-time deposit or it's a multiple-time deposit. Whether the example tells you that. How do you know? Read the example carefully. Pay attention. <clears throat> okay, well, how do I know which of these three formulas to use? Well, between the first and the second, it's now my internet's unstable. Good grief. It must be the last day of class. These two are for when you know the uh, monthly payment or the annual payment or the quarterly payment or the daily payment, the, and that's the deposit. So you know how much you're putting in every month, every day, every year, whatever it might be. This first one, of course, is when you're compounding once per year. This is when you're compounding n times per year. It's just a matter of whether there's an n or not. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. This third one is for when you know the ending amount. So I want a million dollars when I retire. That's the one I use. I want a half a million dollars when I retire. That's the one I use. I want $2 million when I retire. That's the one I'd use. If I say, I know I can put $100 a month away, I'm gonna use one of these two, specifically the second one, because I'm doing it monthly. If I say I can put $500 away per year, I'm using this one, because I know how much I'm putting away on the intervals, but it's annual, so the top one. The fourth formula down here is loans, completely different. We've already talked about and used that one previously. This is your cars, your mortgage, your student loans, loans, your home equity loans, anything like that. So PMT here is the monthly payment you're paying to the bank for them loaning money, whereas in these three payment is how much you're putting into an investment. So if you put $10,000 away for 50 years, if you put $10,000 away for 50 years, it's one of these two because that's just me putting away $10,000 once. If I'm putting $10,000 a year in for 50 years, then it's one of these two. It just matters you know, whether we're compounding annually or monthly. If I'm putting $10,000 a year, that means annually. If I'm talking about a car loan, a home loan, a student loan, it's this formula. So you have to know which formulas to use. All right, so let's try out one or two of these in the little bit of time we have left to spare. <laughs> and I, I really do focus heavily on that seven-figure retirement plan. So Bob wants to retire with a million dollars. If he can invest monthly into an IRA annuity that earns 9% compounded monthly, so again, without inflation, that's the historical average. Depending on where you do your research, some people will say seven, some will say eight, some will say nine. I've seen someone say 10, but nine is the number I see the most. Bob is 25 and will retire at 65. How much should he invest each month? Now, this is assuming that Bob's going to keep putting the same amount in every year. We've already talked about how, in theory, Bob should be adding to that pile each year because Bob hopefully doesn't have a state job and makes a little more money each year. Shots fired. So if Bob gets a 3% raise, maybe he puts 3% more into his retirement in the next year. If Bob gets a 5% raise, maybe he puts 5% more into his retirement next year. Or maybe Bob pays off his mortgage and now he can put 15% more into his retirement each year. All right, so Bob's 25, he's gonna retire at 65. That gives him a solid 40 years. And we're gonna say 40 years exactly. We're gonna say it's his birthday at 25 and birthday at 65. 
we have our R, we have our A. A is the ending amount. He's not putting in a million dollars. He's not putting in a million dollars once or monthly or yearly. This is the ending amount. And then this is our rate, our APR. We're compounding monthly, so that's our N. 25 to 65 means we've got 40 years worth of time to invest in. So we wanna say, a couple of questions. How much should he invest? I'm sorry, how much should he invest each month? How much did he invest total? And how much was free money, AKA interest? Let's get to those questions later though. So that means this is an annuity problem. I even give you the word annuity. I don't have to give you this word. If I don't give you this word, this problem reads the same because I said, how much do we invest each month? That's a regular payment. That's an annuity. So it would not be one of the top three formulas. It's one of the bottom three formulas. The question is, how much should he invest each month? We know the ending amount. So if we go to our formula sheet, we know the ending amount, which means we're on this guy right here. Payments needed to achieve a financial goal. So let me just copy this bad boy so I can get it on the same page. The board will behave. And then we just put all the numbers into this, the spots they go. Circle goes in the circle, square goes in the square. There is literally nothing challenging about this besides circle going in circle, square going in square. It's just practice. Oh, what do I put for A? What's the A? Well, that's the ending amount, the million dollars. So our payment is a million dollars. I know the right number of zeros there. Yes, I do. Then parentheses, R over N, that's the 0 0.09 over the 12. How'd you know it was 12, Mr. Beckner? Why isn't it one? Because we're investing monthly there 12 months in a year. All over, bracket parentheses, which is just a double parentheses in your calculator. One plus R, which is 0 0.09 over N, which is 12, raised to the NT, which is 12 times 40. And then this minus one over here. Don't worry about what the pieces in this puzzle mean. <laughs> just plug them in and go. Okay. Calculator, on, clear a screen, $1 million, $1 million, and times, you might have to hit times, not just the parentheses, depends on your calculator, 0 0.09 divided by 12, close the parentheses, big fraction bar means divided by, bracket means another parentheses, then another parentheses, so I just typed these two things, then one plus, now I'm here, the 0.09 over 12, 0 0.09 divided by 12. Then we're gonna close that parentheses. Now, if I go ahead and raise this, what I'm about to do would be wrong, and I'm gonna correct it to 12 times 40. If I do this in my calculator, this is wrong, because my calculator doesn't handle this properly. What I'm really supposed to do is pre-multiply that exponent, and 12 times 40 is gonna be 480. So make sure you do that first. So I need to do 480. And then let me just delete everything after that to be safe. Then the minus one and close the bracket, which is a parentheses in this calculator. Drum roll, please. Da 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 da. A measly $213.61. That's per month. <clears throat> I say measly, but yes, I mean, to, to most of us, that still probably sounds like a lot of money. But again, with good financial decisions, making budgets, paying off your credit cards, not making frivolous expenses just all the time, this is achievable with a career. Also, maybe you're not doing this in IRA, maybe you're doing this in 401k and your employer is doing a dollar match. Maybe that means you only put $106 and some change in, about $107, let's just round up, $107, then your employer matches that $107 and boom, you hit your $213. <clears throat> now, I didn't say whether this was IRA or Roth IRA, maybe this is tax-free interest, maybe not, that's not the point of the problem. <clears throat> All right, so next question, how much did he invest and how much was free money? How much did he invest? Well, we put in $213 a month and 61 cents for 480 months. 12 years, I'm sorry, 40 years, 12 times per year. So the amount he invested, <clears throat> I'm just gonna put it here, is just the payment times the number of payments, which is 213.61 times 
480. This was a formula we gave you like day one of class. <clears throat> Actual class, not talking about the syllabus. So let's just take that 213, 61, and let's multiply by 480. Drum roll. He put in $102,532.80. And then the interest, the free money, would be the difference of what he ends with, the million dollars, and what he invested, which was the $102,000.80. <clears throat> Some people accidentally just do a million and subtract 213. No, you invested more than $213.61 because you did it 480 times. So be careful there. So 1 million, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus 102. And you can already see it's a big number, 532, 0.80. And it's $897,467.20. That's the free money. And if you did this in a Roth IRA, because we're investing less than six grand a year, guess what? That $900,000 is all tax-free. That is your money. You cannot beat that. You cannot beat that. You cannot beat that. <clears throat> you have to wait. You have to be patient. Oh, but Mr. Beckner, you can't take it with you when you die. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I've heard that too many times. Yeah, but at least when you're 90 years old, you have something to live off of <laughs> instead of the government's social security, which is nothing. <clears throat> <clears throat> and you can pass it on to your children and your children's children, and you can build generational wealth, and you can climb the, the ladder socially and financially and all those good things. You can also be extremely generous with it. If you don't have children, you can just donate your, your earnings after you're gone or something like that. And I'm really getting into some deep stuff now, I know, but I've heard all the retorts for investing and why you shouldn't do it. And the, the biggest one is always, you can't take it with you. And you know what the, the last half of that statement is. <laughs> um, let's do this last one and we'll call it, we have just enough time. Bob can invest $500 monthly into an IRA, a Roth IRA that compounds monthly. So I'm being specific here. $500 a month would be exactly $6,000 a year, which means the interest would go tax-free. Um, now this, how much did he get for free? I don't, it actually has nothing to do with the tax part. I'm just saying Roth to get you used to the language. And yes, the interest here would be tax-free. Last time, if it was a traditional IRA, that means we would have not paid taxes on 100 grand and we'd pay taxes on the 900 grand. Not optimal, but still not the end of the world. You still got a whole boatload of money. <clears throat> and maybe there are ways you can talk to a financial advisor, not your math teacher. Maybe there are ways that you can lessen your taxes on that if you are paying taxes on that 900 grand over time. All right, so $500 a month. This is not how much he wants at the end. This is an initial amount, but it's not just a one-time deposit. It's an over and over deposit, which means that it's an annuity. So we're using the formula with a payment in it. And we're compounding monthly, we're investing monthly, so that means we cannot use this one. This is compounding annually. We're on this compounding in times per year. So this, highlight the whole thing, Rodney. This is the formula we'll use this time because it's a repeated deposit and we're compounding monthly. Da, 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 da. Sorry, and there you see the numbers there. Just ignore them for a second. <clears throat> Bob is 35 and will retire at 65, which means he's got 30 years. This $500 would be our payment. Uh, it's going to get 6% return, so maybe Bob's a safer investor. Maybe Bob invested in bonds more than someone else while he was younger or something like that. Or maybe the stock market just didn't return uh, as much over his life. Again, past does not dictate future. There's our R. Uh, N is 12 because we're compounding and depositing monthly. FYI, for the math, these have to be on the same interval. In reality, they don't, but for these equations, they do. It's oversimplified. Uh, so same thing, how much will Bob have to retire and how much is free money, how much is interest? Actually, not the same as last time. This is different. How much will he have to retire? That's the A. So our numbers, the payment's 500, the time is 30. 
the n is monthly of 12, the r is 6%, so 0 0.06. So that means when we plug these into the formula, again, I'm going to do this kind of quick. We're going 500 bracket parentheses 1 plus 0 0.06 over 12. Please slow this down on YouTube if you have to. Then raise to the nt, that's 12 times 30 minus 1. Then all over parentheses r over n, which is 0 0.06 over 12. You might go to the internet and find a formula that's slightly different. That's because there's assumptions made here. You can see some really crazy formulas on the internet. All right, remember you need to pre-multiply this exponent, so the 12 times the 30, please note that that's 360. So that's what I'll type in my calculator to make sure there's no errors. 500, double parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.06 divided by 12, close a parentheses, raised to the 360 then minus one. Be careful if your calculator makes a true exponent where it's smaller and above, you'll have to hit right then the minus one. Close the bracket, divided by parentheses, 0 0.06 divided by 12. Close that parentheses, drum roll, 500 million and some change. 502, 257, 52. Oh, that's horrible, he doesn't have a million dollars. Well, that's less time and a smaller interest rate. <clears throat> he's making more than double the payment in the previous scenario, and he's still only halfway there because less time and lower interest rate. If you are 18 or 20 or 25, start yesterday. If you're 35, start today. If you're 45, do whatever you can. If you're 55, do whatever you can. You still have time to make up for this, but you'll have to make larger deposits or retire later. How much is free money? Oops, spoiler alerts. There's our A. I had that typed up. So the interest, well, first of all, we have to know what the total invested is, which would be the monthly payment times the number of months. There's 360 months in 30 years. 500 times 360 would be 180,000. Oops, that wasn't an answer to anything. It could have been, but... <clears throat> And then the interest is the difference of what we invest and what we earn, backwards order. So 502, 257, 52, minus that 180,000. 502, 257.52, minus 180 grand. And that's 300 some change, 322, 257, 52. I mean, that's still a decent amount of free money, and in a Roth IRA, it's tax-free, but it's not as good as the previous scenario. Again, the previous scenario was a longer time, so you have more time at the beginning to make riskier investments, and maybe that's how you got your 9% return. This scenario is less time, so we have to make a bigger deposit, and maybe we only get 6% because we're a little safer. Maybe we're too safe, arguably, or maybe the market just sucked over that 30-year period. But still, <laughs> quote, sucking still earns you $300,000. So I wouldn't say it completely sucked. <clears throat> sucking, in my opinion, would mean you lost money. You now have less than $180,000, which is pretty rare. All right, so on that bombshell, um, I'm going to put a problem up here on screen. You can pause this. Actually, no, I don't have the details up here. I thought I had it written down. I just have the amount finance. Never mind, ignore it. We we did a house problem previously, so that's good enough. Last class. All right, so I know this was a lot to take in all at once. I really hope that maybe you'll replay some stuff on YouTube, maybe slow it down, maybe do your own research. I hope I've encouraged you over the course of this class to do this stuff, to do your research, to invest. Anything helps. Anything helps. Please don't be the average American. If there's uh, one goal I have in my career, it's to help people. And it's either help people learn algebra and learn calculus to become engineers and scientists, or it's to learn basics of basic principles of finance so that they don't go to retirement age and not have anything besides Social Security or maybe a crappy pension. And I use the, the word crappy there subjectively. Um, it's still better than nothing. <clears throat> All right, 
It has been an absolute pleasure. I know this has been a weird way to, to teach and learn for everybody. I hope that I've made the best of this scenario as we possibly can. I hope that you've learned something. I hope that you're more functional with Excel or finance stuff or just basic principles, cost analysis in the grocery store, you know, which product should I buy? That was a really easy thing. Simple ideas of proportions and percents, understanding that when you see numbers and graphs in the news, often they're meant to mislead you. Think analyze, reason, ask yourself, does it make sense? Be learned. <laughs> I know that sounds uh, silly, but be learned. All right. Good luck with the rest of your assignments. Good luck studying. Email me with any questions. All that stuff I was saying. Uh, but then again, as always, reminding you of the due dates, just in case you came in late. 8.3 due today. Excel 9-4 due on Wednesday the 27th. Video quiz 5 due on the 27th. Final exam the 27th. So those are our last assignments. <clears throat> uh, remember that we do have uh, the reviews available. Remember that you need to submit your work in Canvas. That way you can get some partial credit as needed if you let me know, if you email me. And also I had mentioned that I was going to post, hold on one sec. Sorry about that. Uh, remember that I said I was also going to post an extra video, kind of a final exam review, some questions from the review. Uh, into the canvas uh, shell. I'll get to that today. So I can't promise it'll be up in the next 10 minutes, but it'll be up in the next couple of hours for sure. Uh, and if you're in my MDE class, it'll be pretty much the same video as that. So you'll see that one twice then if you are an MDE student. Um, but as always, uh, this has been awesome. It's been a pleasure. I hope that you've learned something. I hope you can uh, appreciate some of this stuff and use it in your real life. Uh, I didn't just teach you the quadratic formula to teach you the quadratic formula. Never even talked about it, right? We taught you good stuff, as we were just saying. So, uh, yeah, uh, good luck studying. Good luck finishing everything. Good luck in your finals. We'll get you your grades uh, uh, probably about 48 hours after your finals. You should see them up in SIS. And then I hope that you have an awesome summer after that, productive or fun, whatever you've got lined up. Take care, everybody.